Okay, good afternoon everybody. Welcome back to another SAGE presentation. Um, just before we start, uh, another reminder about um, the programme we'd like to run probably in October, November now. I know it's a long way ahead, but we like to plan well ahead. That's our Desert Island Desks that we're going to run with Brian Nathan. We asked people to submit um, to our SAGE email address uh, a record that brought back memories to them. It could be from the 50s, 60s, 70s, a particular piece of music that uh, brought back some fond memories or something you were doing in your younger days. Uh, we've already had eight or nine people sent in their details and their um, particular piece of music. Uh, can I just say, we really want it so someone can, people can talk about particular occasions related to that music, rather than one or two people have just sent through saying I like this piece of music so I'd like to play it because what we'd like you to do at the time is talk about what the memory is that uh, that music particularly brings back to you. So we'd still like some more people. I'll remind you again at the end of the presentation but the email address is bushysage at gmail.com. All you have to do at this stage is let us know the piece of music and then we'll get back to you in a few weeks and ask you to uh, talk about uh, a particular event that music reminds you about. Right, okay, on to this afternoon's program. Delighted to welcome back Sue Gill. Uh, Sue was actually with us back in 2017. Uh, Sue is a London Tourist Board Blue Badge Guide, but today she's going to be talking about her life in Israel. Uh, she lived in on a kibbutz in Israel for a year before- Two years. Two years. Okay, I'm reading off my That's details fine. here. Okay, all right. She lived in but for a year before, a year before, and a year after the Six Day War. So her talk will include experiences and memories of life on the kibbutz and what it was like being there during the war. Okay, Sue, it's all yours now. Thank you. So I press share screen. Let me go to this. Now I just want to get back to the first slide if I can. Rabbi Keck, can you help me get back to the very first one? What do I press to get back to the first one? Um, that's a great question. Is there a left button or a previous button? Or scrolling up, scrolling well, down? Yesterday when we did it together, you got me to press something which moved the slides, which was wonderful. Yes, you had it on play. You clicked play. play. There's, maybe it's this one. Play slide show. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. Can everybody see the screen clearly? And can, can everybody hear me well? No, they, they can hear you, but they're on mute, Sue. Okay. Yes, well, they can. Okay, well, this is a talk which I've given actually to non Jewish women's clubs to raise money for Blood Cancer UK. Because both my uncle, who sadly died of leukemia, and my sister, who now has lymphoma, both came out to join me in Israel after the Six Day War. So it's very, very near to my heart to do this. And it's been amazing. Diana's been with me at these talks to non-Jewish women's clubs. And they've all been very, very interested in Israel. They've had relatives who've been out there and worked on kibbutzim. I, nobody has any, had any political arguments with me or challenged the idea of Israel at all. So it's been very gratifying. But I'm going to concentrate on Israel when I was there from 66 to 68. I'm going to talk about life on the kibbutz and I'm going to talk about what it was like during the Six Day War. I would love to hear from some of you in some way or other about if any of you have been to Israel, what your experiences were, and I hope it will lead to lots of interesting discussions. I'd like to spe say a special thanks to Rabbi Neil Kett, who's, Nick Kett, who's gone through the presentation with me, and to Marlene and Daphne, who's made this, who made this program happy, happen. Okay, right, so right. Now let's go. Well, a bit about my background and why I went to Israel. This actually is a first cousin of mine who lives on a kibbutz in the north of Israel called Kfar Hanasi, which is a Habonim kibbutz. And it's right up in the north near the Galil. Now, why have I got cousins living on Kfar Hanasi? My father's father was an immigrant from Lithuania. He was actually a rabbi. 
And he came over from Lithuania in, about, in the beginning of the 20th century and had six children. And they were all brought up very strictly, very religiously, and they all used to sit around the table and discuss things like Israel, religion and so on. Of those six children, two, three of them became university professors and two of them became pioneers in Israel. Sadly, my grandfather died when my father was only 12. So they all had to make their own way in life. They were, their mother was widowed during the depression and they had to make their own way. They were very, very inspiring to me. So that was one of the reasons I went to Israel. Another reason I went to Israel was my father was a nuclear physicist and he wanted me to be a scientist. Now you can imagine, I'm the oldest daughter of a nuclear physicist. I used to get 5% in maths at school. Nevertheless, I went to quite a few different schools because we moved around a lot because of my father's work. And when we moved up to Manchester, my father insisted I took science in the sixth form. I hated science. Then I got into university to read biology and chemistry. But my father went off to America for a sabbatical. As it turned out, he stayed in America and never came back to England. So I went up to Kiel to read biology and chemistry and I managed to change my degree to biology and history. I breathed a good big sigh of relief. After I graduated, my parents had had a fourth daughter in New York and um, she's 19 years younger than I am. And I hardly knew her. So I decided to go out to America. The only job I could do was teaching. And what kind of job did I get? A job teaching science and social studies, mainly science. I could not get away from science. I didn't like New York at all. I found it very materialistic, though my happiest time there was teaching in the East Side Hebrew Institute on the Lower East Side in Manhattan. And in my free time, I used to go down to Greenwich Village and I used to meet a lot of Israelis and they revived my interest in Israel. I also belonged to Habonim as a youth. Now I've got some photographs of Habonim. Let me see if I've got, I've got to know. I, I belong to Habonim as a child. We used to go to Henley's Corner and have meetings in Habonim. I don't know, do any of you watching ever belong to Habonim? It's a very Zionist youth movement. So that was another reason why I wanted to go to Israel. Uh, in the end, I went out there with a cousin from my mother's side. This is my cousin. And we went on an Egypt bus tour. We had a lovely time. And then they asked me if I'd like to stay at Kfar Hanasi. But everybody on the kibbutz Kfar Hanasi spoke English. Fancy a cup of tea, love. You know, they're all having four o'clock tea. And I thought, I'll never learn any Hebrew. And I'd only gone out to Israel for a holiday. But once I got there... I sat on a hammock in the garden of a cousin of mine who lived in Herzliya. I looked at the sky and the stars. I don't know if you've ever had one of those moments where you just feel you're totally, totally, totally immersed in the present. That's how I felt sitting in that garden. It was magic. And I thought, I want to stay here. I'd like to learn Hebrew. So I went to a Hebrew school near to Tel Aviv called Ulpan Borhov. It's in Giva time. A suburb of Tel Aviv and I've met quite a few people in Bushy and Northwest London who also went to Ulpan Borokhov. Most of the students there were from Eastern Europe but I was staying with my cousin in Herzliya. I wasn't paying her any rent, she wouldn't take any money from me, not that I had any in those days and I didn't, I wanted to immerse myself more into the life of Israel so I left Ulpan Borokhov and I went to a kibbutz. And I went to the Olpan there, and Olpan's a Hebrew school. Now this is a typical room inside the kibbutz, and I shared a room like this with a French girl. This is a friend of mine from the kibbutz. We had a little stool next to our bed. It was pouring with rain. My parents thought I was completely sugar. that I'd left America, gone there, and I absolutely fell in love with it. And I decided to stay and take this thing called an Ulpan, which was a six month course. It's all in Hebrew. The lessons are in Hebrew, everything. 
direct method of teaching. And I thought, this is really clever the way they're teaching us. The teacher mimed all the actions. We watched him. And I was beginning to learn. And I even began to think and dream in Hebrew. And it was so much better than the way I'd learnt French at school. Translation, conjugating verbs. So we worked in the kibbutz half a day. And half a day was studied in an all pan. It didn't cost us anything at all. So this is the inside of a typical hut. And here are some pictures of us outside the all pan. You can see the row of huts in the background there picking weeds, people from all over the world. But what was interesting about our old pan is a lot of the people then, remember this was back in 66, the year before the Six Day War, a lot of the people were not Jewish. I can still remember a lot of their names. This man was from Holland. There's another one from Switzerland. We went on outings and we made friends with the young people from the kibbutz and some of these I'm still friendly with on Facebook. We went to evening classes on the kibbutz called Kugim where we learned to do things like pottery and so on. Now I'm going, I had something published in the paper about life on the kibbutz so I'm going to read that to you. Um, I'm sorry that my map, somehow the slide of my map has got mislaid so please bear with me but Givat Chaim if you can imagine the coastal road which goes up the west side of Israel, the main road going from Tel Aviv to Haifa, and you go just north of Netanya, our kibbutz was off the road on the right. Okay, so I'm going to read to you what I wrote, which was published in a newspaper. Our kibbutz, Givat Chaim Echud, is surrounded by irrigated green fields and orange groves, and is situated in the center of Israel, close to the towns of Hadera and Netanya. We are dependent on a hitched ride from the junction on the main Tel Aviv to Haifa to reach the kibbutz. The alternative is a half an hour walk in the boiling summer sun. 800 people live in the kibbutz. Approximately one half are members called Haverim, and the remainder are school children, babies, tourists and students at the old panel Hebrew school. Now I went back to the kibbutz a few years ago and surprisingly the number of members has stayed the same, about 800. A but this is back in 66. A child could become a chaver on election by the members at the age of 18. An outsider has to successfully complete a year's candidature before he may be considered for election. And they had weekly meetings on a Saturday night, who would um, become a member and so on. There was no money at all exchanging hands, apart from a small allowance, which I'll tell you about in a minute. Work, food, leisure, profit, and frequently feelings are all shared by the Khaver. Private ambition and personal profit are sacrificed for the communal good. There was collective production of agriculture, fruits, cereals, livestock, and collective consumption. Now, I would open the door of my hut in the morning. Open the door. Outside the door, there were oranges growing outside. When my uncle came to stay with me, he had to, after the Six Day War, he had to get up at four in the morning and go and pick oranges. Naturally, many people can't adapt to this close-knit communal life. A lot of the members were middle-aged idealists, people who'd come from uh, Germany, Poland, Hungary, Romania, and so on. Many of them had been lawyers, teachers, doctors in their own country, and they were, they were quite happy working on the land. A lot of them had been in the camps, a lot of them had stamps from the camps on their arms. Uh, the other members were the Sabras, the native-born Sabras, who apart from army service had never ever known any form of ever form of life. Few adults apart from wives imported from the towns enter the kibbutzim, despite the freedom from worries such as paying the rent, providing education, or caring for the old and sick. Now this was something I particularly liked about the kibbutz way of life. The elderly people stayed on the kibbutz. They might not, they had uh, their own huts, they were looked after, there was free health service, a kupat kol lim, free health service there, there was free nurseries for the children. The social care was second to none. 
Each couple living on the kibbutz has a small house with living room come bedroom, kitchen and shower. The children live separately from their parents in the children's homes, which consist of bedrooms for three, communal showers, classroom and recreation centre. That's back to our Google class. So here are some of the children from the kibbutz and I taught in the school. Now each kita or class lives, sleeps, learns and works together. Until the age of 12 they also eat together. Thus each age group forms a closed group within the large closed superstructure of the kibbutz. These links between classmates persist into adulthood. Not only do young kibbutz raised children frequently find difficulty in mixing with and accepting outsiders, but many young adults confine their social life almost exclusively to members of their own school class. And I noticed that when they went into this big dining room to eat, often the people who were studied in the same class all sat together. What happened in my case was I completed the old pan, and while I was on the old pan, somebody found out that I was a teacher. Someone else also found out I had a degree in biology. They grabbed me. We need a biology teacher on the kibbutz. So an elderly lady sat with me, and I don't know the names of all the parts of, body, of the body in Hebrew, but it was back to biology again, and I was trying desperately to get away from science. Anyway, after I taught for a little while in the high school, what happened was one of the people, uh, the English teacher fell ill and they asked me if I would teach English and I loved it. I loved it. I copied the method that our Hebrew teacher did, this direct method, and started to teach English on the kibbutz. Now this is called the Kitot Benjamin. They had children with learning difficulties, so there's a special school for children with learning difficulties. These are some of the actual children of the kibbutzim, and they all called me by my first name. I used to dress just like they do, shorts and the t-shirt for the class. I even had a little pet dog who used to come into the hut with me when I was teaching. And I'd draw pictures on the board, and I'd act out things, and I really, really enjoyed teaching this far more than biology. And here you can see a few more of the children. And these children here are Arab children. We had a neighborhood school as well. Uh, Givat Chaim was very keen to foster close relationships between the Israelis and Arabs, which was something I liked a lot. Now, every family used to have four o'clock tea in their house, called Arakat Arba. And though the children who were in the children's home would eat breakfast, lunch and evening meal together, they'd all go home to their families for four o'clock tea. And once I'd finished the all pan and I started to teach, a lot of families invited me home for tea. I think the fact that I learned Hebrew made a huge difference to the way I was accepted by the people on the kibbutz. And they actually wanted me to be a member, but it was something I, I decided not to do. Uh, so you go to different members' houses for four o'clock tea, I particularly liked it when I went to somebody called Emmy, who made the best chocolate cake I've ever tasted in my life. And it really, really felt a member of this community. But the three big meals of the day were eaten by the adults in the Hada Ochel, the dining room, where people sit together at tables of six and they select food brought to them on trolleys. So the collective eating meant that women didn't have housework but it reduces the variety of the choice of food. For example, I cannot understand how could Butznik can tolerate having eggs for supper every single evening of his or her life, even if they can choose between fried or boiled. A little aside, something I did notice, even though you had this equality in inverted commas, it was usually the women who worked in the laundry, the women who worked in the dining room, the women who worked in the kitchen picking up the cutlery and so on and stacking it more than the men. Uh, the furniture in each of the kibbutzniks houses was bought with money from an annual budget so that within a limited financial frame freedom of choice is permissible and the interiors of the houses varied uh, greatly. You know, you did see individual tastes there. Now this is another little aside. When I went back to the kibbutz four or five years ago, a lot of things have been privatized. 
money has come in competition has come in and i felt very sad when one kibbutznik wasn't talking to his neighbor why wasn't he talking to his neighbor because his neighbor had taken a shortcut across his front lawn to get to the kibbutz shop or something so you have the same broiguses that we have and that was a bit sad when everybody in had seemed to get on when i was there now each member in 1966 received 120 israeli pounds that was about 40 dollars a year for personal expenses that included travel books and outings but a lot of the outings were free you'd go into tel aviv on a lorry or a truck and you go to concerts or art galleries a lot of the stuff which we did on the kibbutz was provided by members and that was something else i liked a lot for example, I went to a pottery class run by members. I felt there was a lot of creative creativity encouraged. Uh, one member made beautiful batiks. I learned so much about being creative and self-reliant when I was there. Now, in addition to this $40 a year, there was five Israeli pounds worth of shop coupons, which were issued every month to members. And they used those to buy toilets and household goods, coffee, crackers, etc. And they didn't have money to do this. They had little pink tickets. So you could do that. Entertainment was provided by weekly films, a coffee bar with drinks, cookies and magazines. And the coffee bar was open every night, mainly full of the people in their teens and 20s and early 30s. So I made quite a few friends going to this coffee bar. We had Teolim, as I said, trips to all parts of Israel and lorries, outings to exhibitions, concerts and the theatres. Phone calls, air letters, stamps, even cigarettes were provided without charge to members. Now, if I wanted to get in touch with my family, it would take me about two weeks for an aerogram to get out to the States and back again. And of course, there were telephones. There was one telephone, I think, on the kibbutz for everybody. There was no email, no internet, no WhatsApp. So I do wonder now how some of these more remote kibbutzes are faring now with the COVID crisis. Because aren't we lucky to have Zoom and WhatsApp and so on? Uh, because of the absence of a competitive atmosphere, the individual was relying more on self-motivation and the resources. And I felt that the people were competing with themselves. There were a lot of artists on the kibbutz. There was one who got a scholarship to study for a year in London. There were musicians, dancers, singers, architects, landscape planners. There was even a member of the Knesset. And several kibbutz members did work outside the kibbutz. As I said earlier, if any of you have any questions you want to ask me, I'm sure via Daphne you can send me an email if there's anything else you want to know. But I really do hope we'll all get together one day soon and be able to discuss all this. Now, the elementary school, the class had the same teacher from first to sixth grades. The classes were small and creativity rather than learning by rote was stressed. Exams were relatively unimportant. There was also a children's farm and a children's zoo and the children learned to cultivate the land and care for animals. Uh, they, Givat Chaim is very famous for its factory. Next time you go shopping in Sainsbury's, Tesco or Waitrose, wherever you go, if you buy any fruit juice, have a look on the carton and if it's made in Israel, it's a pretty good chance it will have been made in the factory of the kibbutz, which is called Gat, G-A-T. And they, they bottled fruit juice, they had peanuts, Givat Chaim was a lot wealthier as a kibbutz than Kfar Hanasi, where my relatives were living in the north of England, uh, north of Israel. And kibbutzim, some of the kibbutzim are extremely small, some of the newer ones down in the desert. I do think they differ greatly because Givat Chaim was quite different in many ways from Kfar Hanasi, where my cousins live. Okay, right, I'd like to show you some more photos now and then we'll talk a little about the Six Day War. Now, this is a photograph of the cow shed. I became very friendly with an American girl. She married this Israeli man. I'm still in touch with uh, them and their children. Sadly, he could not adjust to life in town. They went to, to live in Tel Aviv, in a suburb of Tel Aviv, and he had a breakdown. Couldn't adjust to life outside the kibbutz. And this is my American friend. These are, we all used to meet in the huts. You can see it's very simple, very 
this is my little dog who used to come into the lessons and some of the friends. Uh, another uh, kibbutznik I'm still in touch with was in the army there. All the women, of course, worked in the army. And this is one of the Teolin. This is just after the Six Day War when we went up to the Arab territories. And that's me. And there's a rifle there. Didn't, I didn't use it. And um, here's some photographs of the various parts of Israel. So how did living in Israel affect me? Well, it opened so many jo um, doors for me. I went on to teach English as a foreign language when I came back to England. Now, a lot of people say to me, why did you come back to England? Why? Well, it was my grandmother's chicken soup. I have to be totally honest. Having gone to nine different schools when I was a child and moving around a lot with my parents. My parents having moved out to America when I was in my teens, I became very, very close with my maternal grandmother. She made the best chicken soup in the world. I came back to London, had a chicken soup, and I'm afraid that was bye-bye Israel. But I never, ever, ever regret the two years I lived there. I learned so much Apart from learning how to teach English as a foreign language, I learned how to mix with all nationalities and all religions. And you probably saw from my photo, there was a Japanese lady on the Ulpan. I would say about 30% of the students on the Ulpan were non-Jewish. After the Six Day War, a lot of young Americans came out. Sadly, quite a few of them were taking drugs and using drugs. Also, some German students came out to volunteer after the Six Day War. They weren't Jewish. Now, I mentioned earlier about the Arachat Arba. Something which surprised a lot of these young Americans were that a lot of the G young German students were invited to the Israeli kibbutzniks homes for Arachat Arba, four o'clock tea, and they weren't. So I asked one of the kibbutzniks why he thought that was the case. And he said, we look at the people as they are now. He said, some of these young Americans, not all of them, I hasten to add, but some of them, they said, they're sitting around, they won't work, they're smoking marijuana. Whereas these German people, they've come here, they're facing a lot of hostility, a lot of prejudice, because some of us had families who were murdered by the Nazis, but they're not Nazis, they've come here. They want to make amends for what people in their country have done. And I thought this was a wonderful attitude to life. Judge the people by who they are, not by what their labels are. So that has stayed with me, I hope, till today. It also made me question whether true socialism could ever exist. I noticed in the dining room that the treasurer of the kibbutz and all the people who were on the kibbutz governing board would all sit together. The people who worked out in the fields would sit together. When I did, I was invited as a prospective member to attend a Saturday evening meeting and they were debating who they would pay for, because they had to pay to subsidize, to send somebody to university. They chose the treasurer's son. When the subject of the cobbler's son came up, no, 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 he's not clever enough. And I do think even though we were living in this idealistic community, Certainly a peck order does exist wherever you go. Uh, right, I also learned about the futility of the war and I'm going to talk to you about the Six Day War in a minute. But um, the other thing I wanted to say is going back to this, uh, who the kibbutz paid for to go to university. They will pay for it, they would pay for students tuition at university, but in return, they required that they would study a subject needed by the kibbutz and to give two years of service to the kibbutz in return for each year of financially aided study. So one girl was very keen on studying psychology, but in the end, she was persuaded to become a physiotherapist because the kibbutz needed a physiotherapist. Another one wanted to study urban politics, but was persuaded to study chemistry. So, you know, it wasn't complete freedom of choice. Now, while I was there, the Six Day War broke out. I'd actually gone to visit my cousins in Herzliya and I was caught in the air raid shelter with them for two nights. But I felt a great loyalty to the kibbutz, so I hitchhiked back to the kibbutz. 
Um, I don't think I have any photos of this. I've just got a few more photos of the kibbutz to show you before I talk about the Six Day War. This is a wedding on the kibbutz. Now, Givat Chaim is not a very religious kibbutz. Uh, there are two kib twin kibbutzim, the Echud and the Meochad. But they did keep all the Jewish festivals. There was a strong sense of community. And this is a chupa on the kibbutz. And this is Purim on the kibbutz. And that's just me teaching English as a foreign language. Okay, I'm going to escape from this now, Nick, and just talk about the Six Day War. Can I switch the slideshow off? How do I do that? Can I, Nick, can I just get on the screen instead of the slideshow? I don't know if it's possible. Hello. Here you are. Okay. So I'd be very, very happy to discuss life on the kibbutz. Obviously, it's changed a lot. A man called Bruno Betteltine wrote a book about children being brought up on the kibbutz. And as a postscript, I think maybe because this was... I don't like to generalize, and it's contradicting what I've said before, but uh, Kfar Hanasi was much more relaxed. And uh, maybe my cousins up there, they don't seem to have the same problem in mixing with people from the town. They seem much more laid back. Maybe because their father's English, I don't know. But um, anyway, that's just a little aside. Now, I'd like to show you this. This is one, this book was painted by one of the six kibbutzniks who was killed in the Six Day War. And it really made me realize the futility of war. This was a very talented man. He taught in the school. He would have become an international artist. And he was killed at Givat HaTamoshet. He was killed trying to liberate Jerusalem. And there were six other soldiers killed during the Six Day War. This is him charming young man I was quite friendly with his family but all of the six lives which were lost on the kibbutz was a great great tragedy I had a telegram from the British embassy, um, British embassy contacted me to say my mother had written to say that she would pay for me to go back to England and join my grandmother if I leave Israel immediately. There was just nowhere I could have left. I can't explain it, but there was a great sense that you had to stay there, you had to be there. All the women, we took over the jobs of the men because the men were away. The kibbutz was deserted. I worked in the dining room during the Six Day War, but it was over so quickly. Uh, I wanted to try and get Naomi Shema singing Yerushalayim Shel Zahav. Um, maybe if I give another talk like this, or maybe the, uh, the shul can get hold of one. But this is one problem when you're preparing something in lockdown, you can't get all the resources you'd like. But it was just magic. The sense of togetherness was unbelievable. And after Jerusalem was captured, it was, it was a magical moment, but it was tinged with great sadness. Uh, so... That was being there in the Six Day War. And I'll just read you something. I wrote this again about the Six Day War. So I'll just read this. Um, I actually wrote this on a table napkin, my feelings during the Six Day War. There's a feeling of unreality underlying the tenseness and uncertainty. My biggest fear is that this is a conflict that could escalate into a world war. No one knows what Russia's intentions are. Has anything changed? I understand people's attitudes to wars and crises so much better after the events of the past week. This grave situation developed in just a few days and already 50 additional men from our kibbutz have been enlisted, apart from the two or three dozen already on active service. service. Shelters are being stocked and people are digging di trenches besides their homes. All these activities create a feeling of panic. On the other hand, there's a great effort to preserve a feeling that everything's normal. Today, when teaching in the kibbutz school, it seemed as if nothing had changed. In fact, it wasn't until I received a telegram from mum telling me to leave for England immediately that I felt afraid. Despite my intense fear, I know that I can't leave Israel now. Is it a desire for personal martyrdom? Is it a great love for Israel? Is it a concern for the freedom of the Jews? I really don't know. Perhaps I could never live my life as a coward, besides which, if the war did become widespread, it would probably escalate into a third world war. But I am scared of bombs. All the young men are gone, and I keep thinking about them, about their courage and how empty the kibbutz seems without them. 
I was unable to finish my reading lesson tonight. It was very frustrating at the kibbutz general meeting not to be able to understand all the Hebrew, but I gather that elaborate plans have been made to return to retain a normal feeling and prevent economic disruption. I think Boris could learn something here. Several school classes will stop studying and start work. I may even have to teach some biology in the school. Tension in the kibbutz meeting mounted and everybody was given an ice cream popsicle. These youngsters all love their country so much and talk about the beautiful Eretz Yisrael. It seems so unjust that anyone would want to spoil these magnificent endeavours and achievements. When I see what has been created in a simple hut or developed from a barren desert, my heart swells to be a Jew. How can I leave now? I made my decision to come to Israel and this means taking the bad times along with the good. I'm writing this at 12.10 a.m. on Thursday the 25th of May 1967. I've still no idea what the next 24 hours will bring and I still can't believe all this is happening. I must be far more of an optimist than I ever credit my, credited myself as being, as I keep thinking what I will do when this is over. I pray to God to give me the strength to be courageous and to help as much as I can in the hard day to come. And when I was preparing this talk, um, as I said, it was originally written on a flimsy napkin, I noted that my son was all this was written on May the 25th 1967 and on May the 25th 1979 my son was born same date so how did Israel change my life I've told you it changed my way of thinking to a great extent it launched me into by uh, teaching English as a foreign language the third thing it did was help me to become a tour guide so when I came back from Israel, I worked for a while at Jewish Care, and then I got a job, guess what, teaching biology. I thought, no, 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 no way, I'm not going back to biology teaching. So I went along Oxford Street, and it happened there was a Yiddish man who ran a language school, so he took me, gave me a job there in the mornings, and then I managed to get a job in an Ilya school in the evenings, and um, I stayed at the same college in Soho for 25 years teaching English as a foreign language. But I was always interested in travel and visiting different places. So I started to organize the student coach trips. And one day one of the drivers said, you should take the blue badge. I think some of you might have heard this story when I spoke to you three years ago. So I went along for the interview to be a blue badge guide. When they heard my degree was in history, they were thrilled, right? But they said, we need foreign languages. We need guides who speak foreign languages. Which foreign language do you speak? I said, well, I learned French at school. Do you speak anything else? I said, well, I've been in Israel. I speak some Hebrew. They were so thrilled. You speak Hebrew? We need Hebrew speaking tour guides. This was back in 76 and lots of Israelis were coming to London for the mitzvah tours. So they were really thrilled, I took the exam, passed all the history and all the exams about London and the museums and places to visit. Then they had to give me a Hebrew exam. Well, who was able to give me a Hebrew exam? A fellow tour guide who'd been guiding for about six years. And in those days, I think there were two Hebrew speaking tour guides. So I went out with her on the bus suddenly realized I didn't know words for things like armor, changing of the guard, crown jewels. I didn't know any of these words. Where do you get crown jewels on a kibbutz? I knew the words for showers, orange groves, things like that. But they desperately needed Hebrew speaking tour guides. So they put me down in the, this uh, lady said, look, you can come out with me on the bus and we'll put you in the um, book as a Hebrew speaking tour guide. Now, in the early days, the Israeli um, tour leader, the Israelis would come over with a tour leader. It was usually a big macho man. One of them gave me these earrings when I just started teaching their Israeli coins, as you can see. So that's why I wear them for the lecture. And they were, I was quite young then, so they'd all want to be a bit macho with me. And they used to grab the microphone and start speaking. So I got out my little notebook and wrote all the words in Hebrew. And after a while, I became fluent. So 
I really, really enjoyed. So for years I worked as, in the summer, in the winters teaching English as a foreign language, and in the summer break as a Hebrew speaking tour guide. So I owe an awful lot to Israel. So now it's time for a discussion. Thank you. Okay. So thank you so much. That's been so interesting. I particularly get the feeling of the letter you wrote during the Six Day War there. <laughs> As you say, 12, 10 a.m., 25th of 1967. So it really has feeling attached to it, and you can see, feel your expressions and your your fear of the time as well. So uh, it's been an interesting talk through. Very interesting. Thank you. Right now, let's see if we can get some questions up. So uh, I'll go back to gallery view. I'll go back to gallery. Yeah. View. I'd love to hear from other people who. Um, or in Israel. So if you, okay. Oh, my mother's come on from Israel. This is my cousin who was on the tour with me. Golly gosh. Yes. Sue, well, I noticed that you, the photo that you showed of us on the tour in 1966, you only showed my backside. So here we are 54 years later and this is my front side. <laughs> uh, I'm talking from Haifa. Uh, really enjoyed your, your talk. Oh, like a lot of memories. Um, one memory I'll, I'll, I'll share, well, one memory you didn't mention was that in the 67 war, my father, my late father, your uncle, uh, volunteered and came out and was on the same kibbutz as you. I mentioned that at the beginning of the oh, talk. You did. Okay. That's well, why I'm raising the money for Blood Cancer UK. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the memory I wanted to share was that um, after we'd been on, well, I'd never been to Israel before, and you were the ones who had contacts there, so you organised everything. And uh, I just followed along. And after a couple of months there, I had to come back to for university. But uh, we were staying with our cousin in Herzliya, Marilyn, and I said to them that I really wanted to stay. Fell in love with the country, and I wanted to join the Air Force. I was already a pilot. And uh, our cousin's husband, Jochenen, took me aside and said, look, Israel needs you, but not now. Go back to England, get yourself an education, make some money, and then come back, and then you'll make a success of it. And 13 years later, that's what I did. Yeah. Lots of memories, Sue. Thanks a lot. And to, to add to all this, David and I, David's a cousin, my first cousin on my <laughs> mother's side, so he and I went out there together for a holiday. I, neither of us had thought of staying. I stayed, David came back for university, and then David went on Aliyah, and he's got three sons who were all born and brought up in Israel. So, but we see each other a lot, don't we, David? We do indeed. That's we're a very close family, and David became very friendly with those cousins from Kwan Asi, or from my father's side of the family. Sue is Trina. I just I'm want to Trina. say hi there. I just want to say, I was on Kibbutz in Achoresh for a year, while, which was down, I think down your Kibbutz, down the road, yes, at the same time. Which at the same time as me? No, well, I was there just, well, just about five, six, seven, just as the war finished, yeah. that was when I flew out for a year. I went to Rex's house and I became a volunteer. And I was on we that kibbutz. Met, do you think we might have met somewhere on that dusty road I, or something? I really don't know, but we had a very parallel time on the kibbutz. Yeah. Very similar. Yeah, interesting. Brought back um, memories. Is there anything you want to add to, that you thought about? No, I mean, like, I, I also, I used to get up at four in the morning and go and pick oranges. And all the men had gone out, uh, you know, on the front. And I, I also stayed in the volunteer huts. It was just almost the same story. How long did you stay there for Trina? I was there for a year. I, was, I lived on the kibbutz for a year and then I came back and I worked for the Dan Hotel Group so I was involved with um, their London office and then I worked for Pell Tours so I was quite involved so with it also Israel. changed your life? Oh yeah I mean it was it was like the University of Life it was an, a <laughs> brilliant brilliant yeah. year. It was. I, by the way, I want to apologise to everybody because I worked away. I had a much more comprehensive slideshow, 
and I developed this other one and I put on the old one by mistake, the one, the original one I made, <laughs> that Diana had seen last year. So I've got about 20 more slides, which because I, I get find this a bit difficult, the technical side, you didn't see the more modern one. So I have to Trina. say. Sorry, not Trina. Um, Sue, I just wanted to say hello to David. Um, he, I'm sure, used to live in Southport, which is where I come from. And I remember David when I lived What's your up. name? It was Joy Sylvester. He probably knew, knew my sister. Of course, Carol. Joy, of course. Yeah. <laughs> your name now, Joyce. Joyce Joyce. Now it's Joy Allenette, but he won't know that. Uh, I, I knew he'd made Alia. I think, I think Carol told me or somebody else. But uh, yeah, it's lovely great, to see you. Great friend. to see you. Yeah. Do, do you want to say anything about Joy at all, David? It's... No, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> How wonderful to have the opportunity to put people together internationally. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, we're a big family, aren't we? Can Hello, I Sue. Ask, can I ask something, Sue? Can I ask? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Well, carry on. Is that, can, can you hear yes, me? Yes, go on. Yeah. Okay, my, my name's Alison. I'm actually here. My mother's Avril Berger. And um, I was just popping into her this afternoon to do, to do a bit of work from home. And she told me that she was um, joining this Zoom call today. And I was sitting listening and I couldn't believe that I was actually on Gavat Hayim Melkhard. I went Mil there. And, you were on Mehud. I was on Ehud. Oh, you're on Me, uh, Ehud. Oh, you're on Mehud. Oh, sorry. Okay, I was on Mehud. But when you go up the road, it was on the right. <laughs> so it could have been Mehud that I was on. Were you on the one where the factory was? Yes, because I worked. That was Mehud, and I was on Ehud. Oh, yeah. okay. What was what was the difference, Sue? They had some kind of row. It's like a Jewish couple who've been married for 50 years. They were all idealists and they all set up the kibbutz together and they had some row and they never found out what it was and they split into two. But, <laughs> but it was wonderful. I had the Shidduch most wonderful was over. <laughs> it was a wonderful time there. It was a wonderful time, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's just great. that I, I made lifelong friends there as well. Mm. I did too. Interesting it changed Trina's, it gave Trina's yeah. work opportunity, it gave me, what about you? Did you get some new work of, uh, when you came back or did you change your direction anyway? I was just, I was, I went out very young. I went out when I was about 16, 17 and um, I came back and then went into um, very uh, very different professions but uh, i had uh, i was there for about six months and then i went i left there and i went to another kibbutz in tiberius um diganya aleph and oh, i'm thinking you might probably thank you diganya aleph and i was there for about six months and i came back and i had a wonderful time but i've got very fine men very fond memories oh, of uh, you, um of, of the kibbutz so uh, anyway sorry to have interrupted just no, I, I, was there, yeah. I was sitting there up the laptop i was sitting there on my laptop way i wanted to ask david as you live in israel david lives in haifa david how do you think the kibbutzim have changed oh dramatically mm -hmm. um most of them now have been privatized so most of the people still a lot of the people still work on the kibbutz but many people work off the kibbutz uh, they've they're in, they're able to have their own cars. They're able to uh, expand their houses. In fact, um, somebody just mentioned Ena Horish. Uh, my wife's cousin lives on Ena Horish. She, oh my she, God. she married a local Israeli there. His name is Ishai Moar, and her name is Jackie Moar. And they lived in a standard kibbutz house. And a few years ago. They expanded it. It's now a five-bedroom, three-bedroom, three-bathroom uh, <laughs> mansion with a huge garden. So, and and this is quite typical now for uh, for kibbutz. It's totally different. Life has changed a little bit on yeah. kibbutzim, yes. Yeah. I think even in those days, I noticed a big difference between Givat Chaim and um, Kfar Hanasi. Kfar Hanasi definitely had the English flavour, and everything stopped for tea at four o'clock. <laughs> David, what work did you carry on doing after your life on a kibbutz? After I 
when we arrived on the kibbutz? Uh, no, afterwards, after, you know. After when, you, when you, David came back to Eng and went to okay. Dundee University and then he went back to Israel. Oh, okay. Did you make Aliyah for about 10 years, did you, David? No, I worked in Manchester for, uh, for 10 years after university, mm. uh, made some money and then uh, went back to Israel. <laughs> <laughs> and what I did was I worked, first 10 years in Israel, I worked in Bank of Poralim in the international department. And then I worked for 26 years for a for an IT company. Retired about five years ago. Very nice. Any more questions for Sue or for yeah. David? Can I ask one? Yes. Who's that? Anne Kassler. Okay, Anne, go on. Um, Sue, two things. Who funded the kibbutz in the first place? I th How they very good them? question, Anne. Um, I imagine the members founded them themselves and if they've got any independent savings or anything they put them in. Uh, David can you throw any light on that? I can, I can give you some thoughts as well. Hi this is Sue's sister Judith. So um, I... Call oh, my family here now. <laughs> so lovely to hear your talk. It's really good. We can't and see you Judith. Can you? There we are. This is my sister, everybody. Uh, in Finchley, not in Israel. Right, right, okay. So I also tried living in Israel. I stayed for a year, a lot of the time, on that kibbutz, Kfar Hanasi. And I've gone back there usually once or twice a year um, since the late 70s. And what I was aware of is that uh, from my first time being there, that there are, uh, when the kibbutz was started, the government, the actual country, needed the kibbutz system because um, their work wasn't focused in the cities. They needed Kfar Hanasi right down the road. There was an airport. And so the government did uh, help fund the kibbutz scene, but a lot of them also had factories that um, gained income pretty rapidly and did farming, and they, they all had their specialties. And what I think um, was a big problem is that the initial people who came, they were all there in it together. They all ate together in the Hadarochal and there was a communal spirit because they had the same aim, aim to develop the kibbutz. But then successive waves of people came to the kibbutz. Some people came with their own private income so they could go and travel when they wanted and buy other things. And I think there was a little bit of resentment that it wasn't a wholly socialist economy. And also for the women, it was extremely difficult because there wasn't really quality. I went around to other kibbutzim too. And even though there was an attempt for it, what happened, as Sue said, was the women tended to work in the kitchens, the, uh, the laundry and all the rest of it. But they didn't have the compensation of at least being very involved with their children. Our aunt, who had four children, she could see them bef between 4 and 7 p.m. every day. She had to walk from one children's hut to another to see her children. In those days, there were primitive huts. It was, it was muddy, and we've seen photographs, and I've heard her personal accounts of trooping through the mud to get to see it. And she found it really difficult because she didn't have a proper career. She didn't have the status that some men had, like her uncle, who was very involved in creating the um, uh, irrigation oh, systems mm -hmm. and things like that. So by I noticed each time I came, something had changed on the kibbutz. First, they got personal phones. Then they got, uh, instead of just popping in on each other, then they got televisions. <laughs> and then the really big change came when everybody, instead of having tiny kitchens because they were eating in the main Hadarochel, everybody did extensions to have their own proper kitchen. And they wanted to eat at home. Maybe that's human nature. And so the Hadarochels, um, certainly on Kvahana Sea, and I think in quite a few other places, kind of well, fell by the wayside and became just sort of communal centers. Well, it, when I went back to Givat Chaim, the Chadarocha was like a paying, it was a bit like going into a self-service cafe. Yeah. I, you, know, you, I had a, you had a checkout thing and uh, you, you still had the trays and everything, but it was uh, and a lot of people went to it at lunchtime. I suppose it was as wealth grew as well and they matured and pe people wanted a little bit more in materialistic terms as well. 
yeah. and uh, independence. Yeah. But as Judith, yeah. as Judith said, you know, each kibbutz was very, very, very different. Judith's been back lots of times because Judith's son is now living in Israel. And Judith right. goes back and stays with Clark and the sea. So Judith's much more in touch with the present situation. Um, I don't go to Israel as often as Judith does. I, I think when I, I think, Judith. So okay. when I was there, a lot of the young people actually left the kibbutz and they went to the towns and they preferred the town living to the kibbutz life. So a lot of the youngsters, when I was there, just after I left, started leaving the kibbutz. Yeah. yeah. And but now some people are going back. Who I was in touch with the fellow I mentioned who had the breakdown. Uh, maybe is atypical, but according to his wife, she said this happened to a lot of people when they left uh, Givat Chaim, that so they had breakdowns, they couldn't cope. I, th I think right. the people in Kfar Hanasi seem to be much more adaptable from the ones I know, Judah. I suppose eventually as well, youngsters wanted a bit more out of life, in the nightlife and entertainment, and those sorts of things, rather than just living in a very tight community well, which young uh, people love work. being in Tel Aviv or if they're religious in Jerusalem but once they have a family it's extremely expensive and actually the Kfar Hennessy has built on the land they've built a lot of homes that they've sold off they've got a whole area of new development and people <laughs> wanting to go back they want that kind of lifestyle they've now got high-speed trains going between north and south so it's much easier to live on the kibbutz and work somewhere else so that is a, a balance that's completely changed as well. Used to be when I was there, virtually everybody was on the kibbutz. I think Sue's kibbutz was different because it was so near Tel Aviv. A lot of people worked in Tel Aviv and were professionals, right, Sue? Yes, yeah. Which wasn't the case. I was they were a member of the Knesset, even. Yeah. So yes, they're yeah. very, very different. I felt I felt Kfar Hanasi was when I visited it in those days was very much like a little England transported to the, <laughs> the north of Israel. One comment, one comment about the way the kibbutzim have changed. Uh, well, my son was, was looking for some space to, to create a, a chocolate factory. One of the places he looked at was on Givat Chaim Miuchad, not Ichud, Miuchad. Now, Givat Chaim Miuchad had at that time the largest kitchen in the country. The kitchen was over a thousand square meters. And, and they served over 5,000 meals per day. And then people stopped coming to the dining room. As you said, people, people uh, developed their own kitchen, preferred to eat on their own. And they closed the dining room down. And the guy was showing around and he was absolutely heartbroken. But uh, that, that's, that's another way that people seem to have changed. Any, any hey, more questions? Yes, Sorry, uh, I wanted to ask two, two questions. Go on, uh, then. I've asked one. The other yeah. one, you said you didn't want to become a member. What did you miss out on not being a member? It, I think what it was, was at the beginning, it was wonderful. Because I'd been to so many different schools and moved around so much in my childhood, I'd found something at Keele University, which coincidentally was also 800 people, this sense of community. And then I found this same sense of community on Givat Chaim. So that was very seductive, you know, to live in a sort of community. So at the beginning, it was lovely. But after a while, every time I picked up a bag to go into the town or something, and about 10 people would say to me, Leanne, where are you going? I then felt very closed in. And suddenly one day I knew I couldn't stay in this very closed community, that I needed more maybe more stimulation out of life. But did you miss out by not being a, a member, whatever that meant? I don't think so. I don't think I, that was um, so important to me. I think if I'd have met somebody and got married on the kibbutz, I would have go, become a member. <laughs> but um, I still, I only had, you know, though at the beginning, and especially during the Six Day War, I felt very emotionally attached to the community. It got to a stage where, you know, you just felt you wanted to move on. In fact, I was accepted to do a master's degree at the Hebrew University. When I came back and had my grandmother's chicken soup, I'm afraid that was the end of the master's degree. <laughs> I, well, I will understand. Any more can questions? Can you hear me? Can yes, hear Nova, go on. Um, to, uh, my aunt and uncle went there in 1927. <laughs> and 
both my I've got two first cousins who are Sabras who live there and there's a lot it was very different when I first went the children didn't even they didn't stay with their parents they stayed with their in, in little huts without and then it just changed a lot but they did so much there and he played the violin on the wall and he was a journalist my uncle and that was my mother's brother so I've got lots of Sabra family there, which is lovely. Um, and they did so much and uh, uh, they've been involved in everything that's gone on, the war and everything else. Yes, David's got his hand up again. Oh, David. Um, David wants to say something. Yeah. No, I think, I think it's there from before. Oh, so. David, your hand's still up. <laughs> okay. <is> hand. <laughs> Any more questions for Sue before we let her go? Can I add one last thing, Sue? I kind of felt just like you that it was a bit too small a community. You felt slightly claustrophobic. You know, it was all familiar faces. What I would say, first of all, I've got the, the family at Kfar Hanasi, they've had virtually no coronavirus. They're, you know, they may take precautions, but there's nothing going on there. And it's a wonderful community, as Sue said, if you're older. So it would be a great place to retire, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Judith, thank you very much for your contribution. David, thank you from yours and especially from Haifa. Lovely to hear from you. I'm my for car to turn up. I thought <laughs> this was going on. But... Sue, thank you so much for a very interesting yes, talk. Please. We have enjoyed every second of it. And, um, you know, it shows you how interested people are. It's one of our biggest audiences that we've had to date. So thank you very much for that. Just for, for other people's interest, we have. Uh, Professor Gerald Alderman next week talking about censorship and self-censorship in Anglo-Jewish history. So it sounds another interesting talk for next week. Can I also again remind you if you've got a piece of music, if you've got, hang on, if you've got a piece of music, oh. um, shall I carry on? Yeah. Okay. If you've got a piece of music that brings back some memories of years ago, please let us know at bushysage at gmail.com uh, and we will then get back to you. So please do that. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. Sue, thank you very much once again. Thank you all. Good afternoon. So it's Daphne, thank you so much. It was it was so interesting. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And thank, thank you, you very, very much. My pleasure. And I'm thank so you, delighted Sue. that my family and Trina and other people made contributions as yes. well. Yes, it was fascinating. Indeed. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Well Bye all. Well done. Bye. 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 Bye.